Arthur Ben Professor <laughs> Professor Arthur Benjamin is a mathematician, which means he combines his love to math and magic to create something wonderful, and is a personal hero of mine. I came across his book, The Mental Math, like 15 years ago, and I was mesmerized. I started performing the trick with much less success. Nevertheless, to this day, I teach my kids the very same methods in this great book, Mental Mass. So, Arthur, thank you so much for coming. How are you today? My pleasure. It's great to be here. You are actually in Israel, in the studio. It's not a Zoom recording. I know, right, right. <laughs> that's, that's very exciting for me. Oh, okay. Now, you are actually a, a mathematician because in your trip to Israel, you had a seminar in the math department in the Technion. Yes. A, and the show plus lecture to the Israeli Society of Magicians. Yes. <laughs> now, Unfortunately, I couldn't attend neither of them. Therefore, you are here. But which was more fun? Ah. Oh, boy. Well, I guess, uh, I guess the, 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 the show in front of the magicians was really special. And in Israel, I came to learn that most of the magicians focus on mentalism, magic of the mind. So they were, um, I've, I've done audiences of magicians before. In fact, I did one last week in England, but, to have an entire audience of mentalists was uh, was very special, and they asked very interesting questions. Wow! Could you just give me one good question about you know when mentalists when all all the things that they do is like uh, pretend or mimic or actually read minds? And yep. when you say no, this is not mind reading. This is a technique which I teach in the book, and what you teach is the very technique that you use. You are not bluffing them. Sure, sure. So, yeah, and they were interested in the techniques for doing rapid mental math. But there are other things that I do that are peripheral to that. For example, uh, I create magic squares and uh, create. I can create a magic square based on someone's birthday. And they found that to be very interesting. Or how would you calculate the day of the week that somebody was born? That takes more practice, but they found that very interesting as well. Yes, I think that, you know, the magic square that includes the birthday was a... I was introduced to it by David Berg by David Berglas in his books Mind and Magic of David Berglas. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when I walk now with kids or with people, I have more often than not I have he was born in 2000 and, mm -hmm. and this blow the entire thing. Oh, okay. In my case, I use like if they were born in 2006, I'll have 20 in one of the squares and 06 in the other. Okay. So uh, it still works out okay. In my now. What? When was the last time that you that you visited Israel? I've only been to Israel once before, and that was six years ago. And you speak a little bit Hebrew? Lo ivrit. Lo ivrit. Lo ani lo ivrit. That's right, I, and that's about all I remember from my Hebrew school days and uh, and and bar mitzvah. And you have a Jewish name? Um, Avram. Avram. Oh, yeah. Avram. Yeah. Avram. Okay, so. Uh, Let's start. Now, I usually don't go for my guest bio, but your biography is so beautifully inspiring. And uh, I would like to please sh briefly share with us some of your biography. Now, in, in particular, you said that when you were growing up, they, they didn't have ADHD, they had ADOS. So if you could please elaborate oh. on ADOS. <laughs> oh, yeah. I say, I, I say have something called ADOS, which is uh, a, a attention deficit. Ooh, shiny. <laughs> um, I say I didn't have ADHD. I had 90 HD. That was well beyond 80, you know. So you were taking, a, you were given volume for like 10 years. I, 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 that's true. This is to slow wow. me down. Yes. And um, uh, that's right. So that's. So that's that's all I knew. I, I had no choice in the matter. And could you please tell me a little bit about your parents? Because your father came from a theater b background, and your mom came from no math background. So yeah. So my 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 father was a, a an accountant by day. So that's and his, as was his mother, which maybe is where the math side of me came from. Uh, and and he was a actor and director in the evenings and you know, non professional. But my brother, sister, and I, what we all have in common is we were put on the stage at a very early age. Um, my mother was an educator. She studied special ed partly because of her special needs child me and um uh she did a great job in 
uh, exposing me to so many different activities and hobbies and interests and those things that I got very excited about, she encouraged me to pursue further, whether it was mathematics or, or magic or theater or whatever. That was, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And, um, my wife and I, we, we raised our daughters with similar ideas. That is, let's expose them to lots of things and see what things they, they love to do. Very interesting. Who is the great Benjamini? <laughs> when I was performing in, uh, in high school, I chose the name, the great Benjamini <laughs> will do magic at your next birthday party. And, um, uh, it's funny because, um, I, I, I think back to those years of performing for five year olds, six year olds, and I think I learned so much. In those years, uh, in terms of how to entertain an audience, how to keep an audience captivated, because if you lose a five year old, they just walk away. <laughs> so, um, it, it's, it, it's, in, it, you, you need to have high energy. You need to have audience participation. It's more of a dialogue than a monologue. And as a teacher, I employ all of that, um, on a daily basis and as, I, as a speaker, as a magician. I think you know that uh, in the era of, of vaudeville, and you can count Alf Losso and Al Baker, when they had to do 10 shows a day, and they had to do it no matter what with like drunk people, they became so professional and could, you know, manage with every kind of an audience that the kind of experience that Alf Losso and Al, Al, Al Baker had mm -hmm. as a 10 shows a day, mm -hmm. you really can't achieve this kind of experience right now when you, when you have like one shows a day or, or maybe two shows a week. Yeah. The closest thing I can, uh, I can relate to is uh, I live in Los Angeles and there's a place there you know about called the Magic Castle. This is my next question. And I swear in God. <laughs> this is my next question. You say it's a Magic I Castle. See, yes. I can prepare it. Well, that's it. We, we see we're, we're in sync. <laughs> we think alike. Great minds. Mentalism um, is, is real. That's actually. right. Is real in Israel. Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but in, at the Magic Castle, uh, you perform three shows a night, seven nights nights straight nights and uh and i would say that it's w even though i'd perf started performing my uh, mental math show 10 years prior to that the experience of doing it every night three times that allowed my act to really acquire extra polish and any new jokes that i might try those that were good <laughs> got reinforced and stuck got stuck there permanently so i owe a great deal to the magic castle for um uh, enabling my show to, um, to evolve. So I had two questions regarding the Magic Castle. One, I think it's not about precisely the Magic Castle, but how was meeting James Randi? Because I think that you oh. told Michael Shermer a great story about the first time that you met J James Randi. I met James Randi when I was, uh, when I was about 20 years old. I was in college and he was performing at the International Brotherhood of Magicians Convention, uh, which he rarely attended these national conventions, but here he was at the IBM convention in Pittsburgh, and I was a student at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And, um, uh, and anyway, people were saying that I was just starting to get some attention for the mental math that I was doing, and, um, uh, people are saying, Oh, you got to show this to Randy. You got to show this to Randy. And I was very nervous because Randy, it was, you know, it was gone. He, well, he, and, and he was, he was famously known as a skeptic and a very, to, to my mind, to my youthful mind, a very negative person. You can't do this. <laughs> you can't do that. And, um, so people are saying, Oh, you have to show Randy, uh, what you can do. So, um, so. Uh, a meeting is arranged and I'm, I'm showing him some of my fast math and Randy looks at me very quizzically. Quizzically is a good word. <laughs> uh, is this, um, and, and he asks me some questions. He's trying to figure out if I'm real or not. You know, it seemed real, but you know, people are good at faking things. And, and he asked me what was some combination of logic and magic puzzles, reasoning that if I really could do this, I probably had to be pretty smart. And if I could answer those logic questions, 
he'd be more willing to believe that I really had the mind that he gave you it. an IQ test, <laughs> a, a sort of a, a magician's <laughs> IQ test, if you will. And I passed it apparently. And then I started, you know, showing him, but look, all you have to do is you take this and you multiply by that and you add this and you know, <laughs> the way Randy tells it, he's like, enough, enough. I believe you. <laughs> and then he got very excited because he, um, he said, you know, can I, can I introduce you to, you know, the editor of Omni magazine and can I, and, and, and I, I, I think there's a television there's a television show that I'll be doing and um and he got very excited because he he liked the idea of promoting me um as somebody who can do impressive things with their mind without having to claim supernatural mumbo jumbo. So you know, in other words, he, even though he had a reputation of you can't, you can't, he wanted to say, here's someone who can and He's just doing mathematics. So uh, I don't I don't think without Randy's influence, I would be performing like I am today. He was a very important um, he was a very important influence uh, in my career. God bless his, me- his memory. And yes, you told me that you you didn't told me you told you told Michael Shemer that in your garage, you have a picture of you with James Randy. And you together I, together I may have the only picture <laughs> it's got the three of us it was for a, sh- a television show he was doing in 1989 it was called exploring psychic powers live you know with James Randy and Uri Geller oh my gosh and so half of the performers were sort of the psychic types and half of them were people with real skills and and they would talk anyway um yeah both of them were very friendly at least to me and so at one point I just said hey guys can I get a photo with the two of you and I guess I caught them both very much off guard because before they would go um um you know here we were with <laughs> the three of us together and they got like a my a wife great picture. just did <laughs> yes you know and I was like um you And so yes I have a, I have a photo of the three of us uh, together but I, I I think um, I think Randy I, I don't I haven't shared it around too much I think Randy wasn't very um, uh, happy with um, being sort of put on the spot that way okay now yeah. the last questions uh, the last question question as a magician how was performing in front of the professor Di Vernon which oh, was like wow. the most influential magician in the 20s yeah century. I when I auditioned to perform at the magic castle um, uh, to uh, I, I had met Bill Larson at some of them ma- at a magician's convention prior to that but he said oh, yeah I should come on with when you go 21 when you be yeah 21. when you turn 21 well so as it turns out I was more like 20 28 29 I was a I was a new professor and At Harvey Mudd College in Claremont California about 50 miles from the Magic Castle so I, and I'd gone to the castle a couple times as a guest and I said okay I'm going to audition and um, and and it was a it was on a Friday afternoon and <laughs> uh, as luck would have it Ricky J was having lunch there and he's like why are they making you audition you should just be able to walk in <laughs> that look he's like, he tells his lunch guest come on let's watch this guy and um, and Di Vernon is is, is in the audience audience too and he must be I don't know 95 years old or something and um, and I just remembered it was it was a lot of fun uh, the, the audition it, it got a standing ovation um, the Di Vernon said this is the best thing I've ever seen and and some guy said you should write that down you should make that part here I said I No, I, I, I've, I've never been um, I've never been outwardly promoting my my magic and performing it's been um, because I've, there's um, so many other things going on in my life as a professor as um, you know a, a, as a husband as a father as a as a backgammon player I mean all these things that oh, I have a great yeah. interest in um, that, a, I, uh, I know what backgammon he <laughs> so, so yeah um, anyway so it's it's been a It's, uh, it's been a great experience. Yes. And I, I really th- credit magic for a lot of my success. And I think success. that some of the reason that you got so great reviews. Oh, Lechaim. Lechaim. Baruch atah Adonai Mecho Alam, Shakon Yom Gavoro. Okay. One of the reasons that you got such great reviews is because it's not magic. It's not card magic. Okay? Mm-hmm. It, it, and therefore, James Randi was so... 
amazed and, and the professor because you didn't do like a false shuffle or so something <laughs> that they knew or it was in their uh, domain it was something something completely different in the same way that I'm in, uh, in utter uh, awe and amazement when I see people of their caliber yeah, performing mm-hmm. and I'm I know a little bit about card magic but not uh I, you know, I have not. You are not graduated. a card sharp. I am not a card sharp in any sense. So oh. I, I, I love watching uh, well performed uh, magic, and and when I get to go to a lecture and they expose some of their secrets, for me, it's just so, sometimes it's just so darn clever. Like, wow, that miracle I witnessed was actually easy, and um, and the the simplicity of it is is uh is is just um, amazing it's 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 as exciting to me as as a mathematical proof where you know like how can this statement possibly be true and then there's a very elegant answer and it's the same kind of um, emotional release for me you you know I had Matt Baker on the show the Buena Vista Shuffle Club and I read I I, I still didn't have Percy Diaconus but you know when you read the magic of Of Matt Baker with the magic of Percy Diaconis and Juan Guam said no this is this is not simple stuff this is like heavy math that you can act I, I don't know how combine into a great magic trick mm-hmm. but some th- serious stuff in graph theory in combinatorics and etc now let's move on to your first book and uh, because the Shabbat is just entering <laughs> and uh, you call a uh, author it with Michael Shermer I did and as a one can see you as a bar mitzvah boy over here <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> certainly looks that way I was probably about 28 years Now, old then yes. my question is and I know that you are friends you were yes. like the fourth guest in his on his podcast and he was on the show also and if you don't know who Michael Shermer is is the owner and the publisher of skeptic magazine is like I think you Uh, secondary to James Randi is like the prominent voice against supernatural phenomena etc he has this great oh book why people believe weird things which not g- only goes to a uh, supernatural and religion also to Holocaust deniers and, and many other yes, things so yes, so yes. the weird thing is not just be re- being religious or being about you know the ESP it's about no no why people believe that the Holocaust didn't occur right or the, or the things that are spouted by QAnon and I mean it's it's as relevant today as it was 30 years ago when and my question is uh, is there is an intrinsic connection between your walk or your just friend because in the last chapter of mental math how to uh, uh, Michael Sherman say how math helps us think about weird things mm-hmm. so would you consider your your a friendship as more than just a friendship because you have like intrinsic connection you know again I think the I think the the influence of meeting James Randy early in my life made me uh, sort of a, a, a very confirmed skeptic and um, in fact I introduced uh, Shermer to Randy it's uh, oh, yes. when we when we got together so and Randy wrote the one of the introductions to our book um, so uh, I, I guess I've always viewed as that mathemat a mathematical mind is a great lens in which to view the world um, and whether it's thinking skeptically or critically or calculating we take calculated risks every day of our life whether we're explicitly doing a calculation or not um, I think um, having that mathematical mindset is invaluable I can ask you know from the I can attack this point you know I had a, a talk with Adrian Moore from uh, Oxford University from the philosophy department and he just wrote a book about about Gedel last last theorem or no lost uh, just get the theorem and we know that Kant when he uh, did his work about the infinity he became very mystic so maybe when you touch you know the edge of the edge of math not mm. just mm. arithmetic mm. and calculation sure you say just a second in the foundations in the true foundation of math you need to be you need to believe in there is something. there is an element of faith right in the same way as what is the tiniest yes. particle in the universe and don't yes. quiz me on physics no, no, but okay. but again it's there's almost an okay. element of you You need to believe in something faith. there has to be something there yeah um, so um, 
So yeah, I, I, I but but to me, the I, when I'm thinking about the applications of mathematics, it's it's the stuff that isn't questioned it's the it's the stuff uh, that's maybe has yes. if you go dig deep 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 down there's you know there's an element of faith but once you accept certain axioms yes. and you build from that Definitely. you know then the the you know the the laws of algebra still will apply yes. and the laws of arithmetic will apply and the laws of probability and statistics the sun will apply will come a how does it go? The sun will come out tomorrow. Okay. You, you bet, bet your bottom dollar. Bet your bottom dollar the sun will come out tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> okay, so mental math. What is it? I guess to me it's, uh, it's doing arithmetic in a way that is, that seems almost magical. Um, I'm giving a calculator. Give a ca someone's be, someone's giving, giving a you a calculator. Yes. All right. So how about how about rather than talking about it, why don't yes. we just do it? Okay. okay. So yeah. so give us a, a two digit number. Just a two digit. Number. My number is thirty one. Thirty one and another two digit number. Uh, sixty seven. All right. So multiply thirty one times sixty seven. Make sure you get two thousand and seventy seven. Just to make sure the calculator is working. I hate working. you because okay. I know how you do it and I can't right. do it. So um, okay. So oh, I'm supposed to look uh, at. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, let's, uh, I'm just seeing where to channel my attention. All right. Now, my specialty is squaring, taking mm -hmm. numbers, times, and selves. Do you, you, you calculate, yes. might even have a shortcut for squaring. I, Let, I can. Okay. So let's just test you out first. Do a, give us a two digit number and, and square it on the calculator. 52. Is 2704. But that's really testing you, not me, because yeah. the two digit squares <laughs> I've done for such a long time that they're practically memorized. But the three digit squares and higher, I really do have to calculate. Give us a, a three digit number and I'll try and do it as quickly as you. 700 and uh, 754. That should give you 568,516. <laughs> I hate you. Oh, I have an audience here. Well, hello there, everyone. <laughs> okay, uh, just it's, a four digit number square and we are uh, done. Okay, um, let, let, let me write that four digit down just so okay. I don't have to okay. remember what it is. It'll make okay. it just a little a bit sharpie. easier for me. The Sharpie. The oh. Sharpie. <laughs> when I'm not feeling so sharp, I use a Sharpie. So okay, so. Go ahead. Or a magic marker. I'm That's not right. I'm going to do it with 1000 because uh, I know how to do it. Okay. Uh, Eight thousand three hundred and seventy-two. Okay, this will take me a little bit of time. Oh boy! So bear with me. Uh, Seventy million. Uh, thank you. Um, Twenty-three thousand eight hundred twenty-four. No, that can't no, be right. Let me try. Let me try. Let me try again. Let me try again. Um, all right. So, oh, all right. All right so, eight, eight, three, seven, two. Okay. So, okay. Start, try that one again. All right. I'll stick with, I'll stay, stay with 17? 70 million. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Um, <laughs> okay. Here we go. How about 90,384. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Now, as someone who read your book yes. and know your methods, yes. I'm even more impressed. I thank you. <laughs> I'm even more impressed because, you know, I, okay, now let's go to the second question. I have a calculator. Why is it good for? Well, a calculator is great for <laughs> allowing you to solve problems when the focus is not the arithmetic, but the arithmetic is a is a tool, a goal towards getting the answer that you want. So, um, I mean, I use calculators all the time. On the other hand, um, I think that in schools we should spend a little more time teaching mental math. That is not something that gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. There will never be a time in your life when you're going to have to multiply two three-digit numbers on paper. You will either pull out a calculator, get the answer, or you just, if it's mental, you just need a, a quick estimate of the answer. Which is guesstimation. Guesstimation. Which is much more important than we like. That's right. When we teach mental, when we teach arithmetic, it's based on pencil and paper, and it's almost always taught 
from right to left. That is, it's taught first you get the ones digit, then the tens and the hundreds and the thousands, and eventually you get your way to the millions, right? But the most important numbers are on the left. It's way more important to know that your answer is a little over seven million than to know that your answer ends in four. Yes. Right? And yet we spend all this effort you know, when our minds are freshest and clearest on the ones and the tens and the hundreds, and you're probably making a mistake by the time you get to the important part. Unless you want to do elimination on your SAT, okay? Okay, this answer. Well, rely, that's an artificial yes. reason, but yeah, you're right. But, you're but right. unless you want to do elimination on your SAT, you must first start left to right and not right to left. I think in terms of what's practical in the real world is, um, yeah, working from left to right is the way to go. And cognitively, we our brains are wired to think, when I say left to right, I mean from the most significant to the least significant, from the millions to the thousands to the hundreds to the ones, and not the other way and around. And I can see it in the academia when students go right to left, when they can they can have an error in a magnitude, okay? Right. Okay? Because they don't have the intuition. Exactly. And this is very important. If you could please elaborate on this, because I think many students, you know, miss this very point. We need the intuition. We, Richard Feynman once said that before you start like a Fermi problem or a Fermi uh, question, you need to have some sort of intuition where should it approximately be? That's right. That's right. Um, cause, and that's, that's probably important just on its own, just to have a real good sense of what your numbers should look like. Um, so yes, I, I agree. I, where, where I apply it, by the way, on almost a daily basis is, is in backgammon or sheshbesh out here, oh, right? Oh, is, oh, uh, thank you. Thank it's you. my, uh, my, my, my hobby of choice. It's, uh, and it's a game where you're, you're not, it's a game of numbers, at least when you play competitively. And, um, and you're not allowed to bring pencil or paper or calculator. So you do have to do a lot in your head and to have a good sense is a n good number sense is very important. I, I must ask you about the math of backgammon because I, I had a very uh, harsh discussion with one of my friends. What do you do when you have three and four? At the beginning, ah. do you open the two mm -hmm. or do you want to go for the seven? And I said, there should be like a, an objective answer giving your willingness to take risks. Sure. And it's actually the, the role you, you mentioned, the three, four, there are two, largely two ways that people will play it, either bringing two checkers down or one check, the back checker up three and the, another checker down four. And, um, uh, and to some degree, it's a matter of style. But if you're playing in a in a tournament, it there is a definite right or wrong answer depending on whether you are winning the match or winning the the match that you're playing. Are you ahead in the score or are you behind in the score? If you're behind in the score, you definitely bring two checkers down. It's more likely to create games that are worth two points or four points. Whereas um, if you are winning the match, you want to play a little more conservatively yeah. <laughs> wow. and you want to, you make the other play. So there's a And the idea is that, that you can it. use the math to get objective answers. And, and in the last, oh, 10, 20 years, computers have come on the scene and using neural networks. And it's now uh, unquestioned that the best backgammon player in the world is a computer program, that no human can would be considered a better player than, than the best computer program. But can program. we say that the best uh, uh, backgammon player is a computer back, uh, program that loves risk? Well, Can we say I don't say it loves risk, it measures risk. You know, it isn't something that is, risk isn't something that is either positive or negative, it's something that you weigh, it's something that you manage. You are, you, yes, you take, you take small risks uh, to make big gains. No, but right? the idea is how much, you know, the quantity, how much, because in, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in finance, mm -hmm. we have people who love risk and therefore they will invest, invest in very risky Sure. Uh, uh, trades, oh, right? Okay, all right, all right. So, what do we? What can we say about this uh, computer program that mm -hmm. play chess? Uh, that play backgammon? What do you? What can we say about its character? About care? About about its personality? You know, um, 
it, I would say it's different than a little different than the personality that the top players were using in the past. I think in the past players were um, played a very pure game that the that the way to win was to build a blockade in front of your opponent and to do something committal like attack your opponent when they're on their ace point at the very beginning, was considered a, a beginner's idea. But the computer would say, oh, well, if the rolls tell me I should be hitting on the ace point, I hit on the ace point. It's just saying there is more than one way to win this game. You don't have to only win by a blockade. Sometimes it's a race. Sometimes it's an attacking game or a blitzing game. This is interesting and because I had a talk with an with a chess expert, he specialized in machine learnings, algorithms that play chess. And he said, you know, when, when computer plays chess, it's unesthetical. It, it's not beautiful to see. Sometimes, you mm. know, he, he doesn't do like a, a very elegant maneuver because right. the objective function is just to win the game. And, and to some degree, he, uh, something similar has happened in backgammon in that the way players are appreciated and recognized in the backgammon community is by is by what is their performance rating their pr and that pr is given by the computer in other words the computer will look at the games that you've played and you know the expression, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. <laughs> well, that's what the computer is doing. It's not so much whether you won or lost your match. It was, did you play your roles to their maximum efficiency? Did you take the right amount of risks? Did you take... and. Um, and so as a result, because people want to say, oh, I play, you know, to be a grandmaster, your, your PR, it has to be under a four. The best player in the world has a PR that's around two, you know, and, um, and so if, um, uh, so nowadays the best players in the world are all trying to play According in to the, the same PR, style. Yeah. To, ah, to okay. minimize their PR. And, and so you don't see quite as much of a diversity of style as you once did in this game. Wow, this and, is so interesting. And, and if, if, if Google, if DeepMind were to play, play Gamma instead of Go. And, 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 and in the process, find that there were other strategies that played, that it played better than the current reigning chess program, uh, backgammon program, extreme gammon, um, you might see an, you might see a change in human style as well. Wow. If there was a, a new dominant program out there. As it is for the last dozen years, there's been one accepted computer program that is the standard that everybody extreme uh, gammon extreme gammon extreme gammon 2 you know maybe <laughs> maybe in a few years we will see extreme gammon 3 come out but um this is very interesting because when deep mind uh, uh, develop uh, alpha go and then alpha go 0 what you know the main point of the alpha go 0 was that now we have new strategies that were unknown to human beings before AlphaGo Zero came. Exactly. And now, is this the same with Extreme Gammon, or Go is much, much more sophisticated, complicated, complex game with 10 to the 190, I think, different permutations, much more complex than chess. Therefore, in we don't, we can't learn so much from Extreme Gammon about different strategies then we can go or learn from Go. Well, so I, I agree that, that Go and chess are probably more complex than backgammon. Go uh, is much more than chess. And, and so, and certainly from a searching out the, the, the search space, yes. yes. But backgammon is different in that in, in chess or Go, when you make a play, a play is only as good as your opponent's best response to it, right? You're doing what might be called a maxi min, mini max type of calculation. Yes. In backgammon, it's an average. 
So there's no point in looking several moves down the road. It's more of a, you know, this is, you know, is this the best play? Well, if they roll a 6-4, it's terrible. But if they roll most anything else, it it's a good play. And uh, so you, um, so it's, it's, it's a different, you're not worried about, you're not worried about the worst thing that can happen. You're more focused on the average thing that can happen. So it's a, it's a different game for that reason. And it's, it's a game that's more like life because it's decision making under uncertainty. By the way, I think the game of poker is more complex than backgammon because there are so many more variables involved. You've got, you know, the, the hidden car, the hidden information, the, the number of, of chips that you have, where you're seated at the table. Definitely. Very, you know, it's, it's all, and again, some of the best, uh, poker players have very mathematical minds and some yes. of the best backgammon players, oh. um, have either moved into poker or they've come back from poker to, um, to backgammon. You know, it According to Judaism, you cannot tattoo yourself. But if it was legal, according to Judaism, the one thing I would have to do is base law. Because <laughs> I think the base law is one of the most important laws in math because it enables you to quantify your beliefs. Mm-hmm. How much I believe yes, in yes, H, yes, P of H, the right. hypothesis. How much do I believe in something right. and what has to be done or what has to happen in order me to change my beliefs. Right. And that, that, that would apply very well to the game of poker. I, I think your hand is one, is in this range based on yes. your, the, your behavior, based on all I've seen. I, I um, think, you know, that M- Michael Shermer and, and Christopher Hitchens, you know, the very same in this very point, they fall short because I was, uh, I think that many people ask Christopher Hitchens, what has, what needs to be happen in order you to change your mind? Yes. And when, So not amount of evidence will ever cause you to change your mind. Interesting. So you I, are, I would think that they are, would have had an answer to that. More, you can't be... So yeah. you are not scientific. No, you, it, any scientific theory has to be falsifiable. Yes. Otherwise, it's not a theory. Yes. And, uh, and that's... And, and that's the argument. It's like Paul the Octopus, okay? Right. <laughs> It's Paul, Paul the Octopus, you know, who predicted all the, all the matches, I think, in the... World Cup, yes. like 10 years ago. Yep, and yep. when I teach base law, I ask my students, what do you think more uh, acceptable? That it was just pure luck. And I think it was seven games. So it's two to the seven, one divided by one, one, two, eight. Okay. Yep, yep. So less, much less than percent, all that Paul the octopus got, you know, supernatural powers from God. Right. And which is not acceptable because Paul doesn't live in Israel. He's live in Germany. Well, okay. Well. But okay. And then I ask, and then I ask, how many matches Do Paul need to predict correctly in order for you to change your mind? And many students say, no matter how many matches, no, this is a very bad thought. Right. You need to have just, you, you know, the, the, the question has to be, you know, uh, let's say, let's say Paul gets, gets 20 matches in a row. Now we're talking one in a million. Yes. My thought starts going to not so much the, the uh, supernatural thing. It's not the supernatural, but either, either is this a trick? That is, are we not seeing a, are we record? selling the games? Are we selling the games? Right. Or, or maybe even, maybe even the octopus is at least being influenced to yes. pick the winner in you know to pick you know now more knowledgeably okay argentina is playing saudi arabia yes. you know maybe the, uh, the you, octopus okay, is going to maybe pick. according to the flag but i think that this is a very interesting point when you say okay i'm skeptic and i think that this is my problem with many skeptics i skeptic myself okay mm-hmm. and I, i think i consider myself a religious skeptic jew yeah, yeah. nevertheless no but you do have to have a threshold at yes. which point where you say huh I now have to like you know um, well, I, I remember uh, I remember a a uh, backgammon player who said you know those people who you've been playing with they've been che- they've been cheating and I can even show you show you how he said here's how you know, they were using these things called baffle boxes and you would throw the dice in a in a box yes. and it would and the number would come out now these boxes were made in a very simple way yes. very old baffle boxes and they say yeah here's how so and so rolls double fives and he took he, he, he took his hands and he threw them through the baffle mm-hmm. box and out came a double five and the player who watched that said do that again 
you know, because, okay, just like that. Double fives. He says, do it again. Double fives. And at that point, he says, I think I'm convinced. Because if you, you just claim that you would roll double fives three times in a row. And you claim before you roll and, double and, five. And I, I, yeah. I you know, I, if, if, if someone just does it once, well, that's one in 36. You know, that can yes. happen. But to do it three times in a row, that's one in 36 cubed. That's what, one in 46,656? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yes. You know, you, you're going to say, All right, now, I'm, now I'm really starting to believe you have something because this is – so. but that's what it took. It took yes. three times in a row before this – this um, very strong backgammon player started believing, okay, I think we have to change our procedures here because and, clearly they are beatable. And again, it's all about the, the priori beliefs because my priori probability that God spoke with Paul is extremely low. Therefore, I need a very big evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Therefore, I, need in, in, I mean, even Michael Shermer would yes. say, what, in, or, or Carl Sagan, yes. improbable, yes. extraordinary claims yeah, require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. Right. Okay, um, now let's move on. Let's move on to, oh, we had right versus left versus life, the portrait of guesstimation. And in your book, you write in chapter three that when you were 13, you practically uh, independently invented those methods because what you do right now when when, when you square 52 mm -hmm. you don't do what normal people do right. normal people will, will, will do approximately uh, 50 plus 2 square and mm -hmm. then it's going to be a plus b square it's going to be a square plus 2ab plus b square what you which wouldn't be for that yes. problem that wouldn't be so bad right? because it's 50 because it's 50 um but, we, but you, you're doing something completely else you're doing 50 times 54 Plus two square. That's it. And is, and and even from the sound of it, mine mine yes. required really two steps. The last of which was add four, and yes. instead of three steps, right? So fifty times fifty four plus four is easier than fifty squared plus two times fifty times two. And when you are four. doing one hundred and twenty six, for example, yes, good. what you are doing is. 100 times 152 which you can do which you can do because it's, it's 15 it's it's 15200 plus, plus 26 square which, which if is, you know is 676 yes. now it's 15000 876 and, and the, if you the do 1132 so it's going to be 1200 and no, 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 no. You're going to go all the way down to a thousand. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. 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 Yes, okay. It's times, very hard. <laughs> yes, times. LF, you, were, you were on the right track. Yes. I, I interrupted. It's 1,001 uh, times 1,264. Uh, 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 and, and 64, which is 1 million. And, and this... This is where yeah. it gets hard. Right. And now, because now, you need to remember, you need to just have all those numbers in, in, in your hand and you know the paper, the magical number seven plus minus two. So our, <laughs> our, our, right. our working memory That's right. don't have that capacity. So, and so, as you know, but I'll explain to your audience, what I do is, first of all, I'll say the million. 70 I'll million. Say, I'll say the one million. When you heard yeah. 70 million, that was for me to get the number out of my brain and into yours, so I could forget it. Yes. Okay. So, in the problem you just said, where you'd have 1,000 times 1,264. I need to do it in English now, because he, you are here. I say one and million. And you're not speaking Hebrew. And, and the <laughs> one million gets yeah. stead. And then I, I have to hold the 264 while I do a separate yes. calculation. Now, I use a phonetic code that I learned from a magic book that I read in high school. Harry Lorraine? Harry Lorraine's book. Um, now, that code, I want to make sure is credited correctly, goes back centuries. It was called the, the major system. It was the English version of it was created two in the 1800s. Two is true. I don't know. No, no. One is a T or D. Two is an N. Three is an M. Four is an R. We have our and, version. And so, by doing it this way, you can create you can turn numbers into words. So if I, if you did one, two, six, four, and you say the one million, the two, six, four, you have an N sound and then the CH or J sound and the R sound. And I would make a word like nature. 
right? Or injure or some injury. Any mm-hmm. of those are fine. So I would say nature, nature. And, and now I'm holding on to the word nature instead of 264. And that's especially Much while easier. I do, especially when I'm working with other numbers, nature is going to stand out like oh, okay. a sore thumb. 264 <laughs> might turn into 624 or something. But nature, and now I can focus on squaring 132. By the way, mm-hmm. as a guy who practiced those very methods, just get the uh, word nature out of 264. Once you have the letters, it's not s- such an easy task because you need to go over, okay, which, which word does all this? Well, I guess that, that yes. to me is a, that's something that with a very basic amount of practice in the same way that typing on a keyboard, you know, there's a, there was a time when it was a deliberate, where is the A, the S, yes. the D, but the But how F. did you invent it? How did you? came up with those great methods? You know, well, first of all, as I, I want to say, these methods have existed for almost as long as arithmetic has existed, right? So I had the pleasure of discovering these on my own, but... A few years later, in a book <laughs> by Martin Gardner on recreational math, mathematical cal- carnival... I remember that. When I read those methods, it ruined my day. It did. Still, yeah. the fact that I had discovered it for myself was very exciting for me. The concept of I, uh, in, uh, independent inventions. In, uh, sure. And but, I think but how? How did you, how did you come up I'll with tell, those well, methods? I'll, I'll, tell you the, I'll tell you the story. I, I remember because I was... Because you never told the story. I, I, um, came, I read and listened to all of your... Really? Uh, okay, well, I'm going to tell it. All your it may, Spotify it may, interviews. It may sound familiar when I start it, but here, okay. here it goes. Um, I know my wife, Dina, has heard it oh. before. So <laughs> I remember I, she bet. I, was, uh, like, I was like 13 years old, and I was... Um, I was on a bus going into the city of Cleveland, Ohio, where my father worked. And, um, and like many a 13 year old, I started thinking about numbers that added up to 20. Okay. <laughs> and I said, hmm, I wonder if you had two numbers that added up to 20, mm-hmm. how large could the product be? You know, what, what two numbers that add up to 20 have the largest product? And I was just thinking, I said, probably in the middle, 10 mm-hmm. and 10 it's 100. is 100. I said, let's try 9 and 11. 9 times 11 was 99. That was almost 100, but it was shy by 1. Oh, okay. Then I did 8 times 12 was 96, Hmm. which was almost 100, but it was shy by 4. Then I did uh, 7 times 13, which is 91, which was shy by 9. Oh. And I saw 1, 4, 9, and the next product was 84, which was 16. 16. 5 times 15 was 75, was 25. <laughs> I said, oh, that's cool. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. Perfect I can see squares. the pattern. I see a pattern. Let's try. Now, how do you know if a pattern is going to work? Well, Try another example. If it doesn't work, well, you just got lucky. If it does, you need to believe in induction. Yeah, well, in that, order that, it, in this, order this is called well. inductive logic. <laughs> so then I said, oh, let's try. Let's try numbers that add up to uh, twenty-six. So I start in the middle. Thirteen times thirteen is one sixty-nine. Mm-hmm. Twelve times fourteen is one sixty-eight, which was shy by one. Ooh, that's promising. Eleven times fifteen is one sixty-five, shy by mm-hmm. four. Ten times sixteen is one sixty, which was shy by nine. And the pattern went on one squared two squared three squared four squared five squared and then i had what might have been one of the most creative ideas i've ever had in my life which is unfortunate because we're talking almost 50 years ago (laughs) but nevertheless i said you could actually apply this pattern because let's say you wanted to calculate 13 times 13 instead do an easier problem do 10 times 16 those numbers still add up to 26, but it's an easier multiplication. But it's shy by uh, three nine, squared. It's shy by nine, then you add. And that's exactly how it came out. Wow. And that was the pattern. I was taking algebra at the time. At, at, I was in eighth grade and, and, um, and so Whoa, in theory, wow. in theory, I could have proved it by algebra, but I, but I just, to me, it was more of a pattern. And I was like, wow, Whoa. this works. And then one day, actually in the algebra class, a few months later, the teacher left an answer on the board and it was 108 squared as the answer to some algebra yes. problem. And I blurted out, and that's 11,664. And she says, Yes. How did you do that? And I said, I did 100 times 116 plus 8 squared. she never... No, but she knew. She was very smart. She was a very smart algebra teacher. And she recognized what was going on. And she said, 
and can you prove this? And I said, sure. And I pulled out pages and pages of examples. You know, mm -hmm. it works for big numbers, small numbers, <laughs> negative numbers, fractions. Yeah. You know, the, the proof is a time a, a to square the number A. You do A minus D times A plus D plus D squared. That's mm -hmm. one line of algebra. Yes, because A square minus D square is A plus D minus A times I'm a sorry. minus d a minus d okay yeah I, I need to that's move. exactly yeah so yes. you just see it written yeah. down but so the algebra is very simple but i hadn't gone out i had not approached it from the algebra i approached it from the number and pattern. you have many other cool methods for example when you multiply something by 11 okay 52 times 11 you add just 5 plus 2 7 and you inject the 7 in the middle 572 sure. that or when you have 23 times 27 when the and uh, once digit adds to adds to 10 so it's 20 times 30 plus 21 yeah and my question is if those met methods are so cool yeah. are so intuitive yeah why i never came across them in school yeah. and why people why is it it's not just israel you know and because you perform all over the world mm -hmm. people have never heard about those methods well, some, some in of them for sure the class public in the public That's school right. system you have to go through why they, they have to discover it through martin gardner yes. or through number file or through number, other oh, number file. Oh, okay wonderful you know the, you know right. i mean or or through other cool or or they, they see one of my YouTube, lectures but before or YouTube. youtube you had you just need to go from amazon and to get like oh, speed math the, the, or so. something like that yeah. yes but um so i don't you know I think, unfortunately, I have a theory. we are. <laughs> I have a theory. I, I think I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my theory okay. first, yes. which is I don't think most countries, most countries put enough value in the to the profession of teaching that we do not. We do not seek to bring the best and the brightest to become teachers of our students. They are not. They're not paid enough. They are not given the best working conditions, and and people who show strong mathematical talent are are they're 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 encouraged to go into science or engineering or accounting or finance or law or business or medicine, but they don't say, "Wow, you were such a great student, you would be a great teacher." Now they do that in some countries. You know, you, they do that in Japan, in Singapore, in Finland, in Canada. And it's a very attractive profession. And I think in those places, as long as there's not a culture of testing for a standardized test, you, you will see, you'll let, you let the teacher teach on their own, mm -hmm. let them excite the students the way they, that they are naturally excited about the subject and you could see some of that happening. But if you're, if you're, if you don't trust your teachers, then you have to be very, you know, then you have to mandate a curriculum. Yes. You must teach this. You must teach that. And we're going to, we're going to test to see how your students are doing by giving them certain tests. And now everything is driven towards these tests and it takes the fun out of the subject, you know, like air out of yes. a balloon. So I think that my theory is not that far away from your theory. Again, especially regarding the standardized test, because what we want to do is to get out of school people who can't fail in multiplying two two digit numbers. So what we want to do is to teach them in the most robust robotic automatic way Automatically. that no one fails. Yeah. But if your objective is that no one fail you inject mediocrity to the system because I can't use those methods because yeah. in, in your method, okay, you could uh, think of this problem from this perspective or this perspective or this perspective or right. this perspective. It, 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 it changes math, which can be used as a subject to, inf to enforce disciplined thinking. Right. That's, that's what we use it for. But it, you're missing out in an op, uh, of an opportunity for math as a way to teach creative thinking. When I, if I, if I were teaching, teaching math at the, at the, at the elementary level, uh, or even when I teach math at the college level, like I do, I often will say, find more than one way to solve this problem. 
right? And that's a life lesson. There's yes. sometimes there's a fast way, yes. sometimes there's a more laborious way, sometimes there's a aha, think outside the box way, you know, and um, find more than one way, find more than which one is the solution. extreme opposite of what we are doing right now. Because if you get the right answer, but you didn't do it according to the way they taught you. You are getting uh, marked wrong. Yeah, Mark, oh, and 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 this o- is a, only, the extreme opposite. Only a good teacher will say, "Oh, I like your creative approach." Yes. If if you're a if you're a little nervous and you say, "No, no, no," the, I don't know if that's going to work or not, but this is the way you have to do it. That's a prescription for mediocrity, as you say. And you know, uh, I had Danny Kahneman on the show, and he's a very famous uh, uh, cognitive. S- psychologist yes and he said that you can measure the amount of int- intellectual stress by just measuring the width of the pupil <laughs> and he said there is no more tedious challenging task to ask a student a Stanford graduate student than to multiply two two digit numbers mm-hmm. and therefore I think you know that we concentrate on the multiplication table but the multiplication table is just one by one and when I teach my kids I want to just you expand beyond the one by one I mm-hmm. want to go no don't teach the multiplication table by uh, up until 10 try up until 20 because then you you break the one digit limit mm-hmm. what's your take on that well first of all I I, I, I would say you Sure, teach them the multiplication tables through 20, but don't make them memorize it. Now teach them a shortcut. For example, if, so you, want to, if you want to do something like, um, just g- give me two numbers between 10 and 20. I'll just use uh, them. 14 and 17. So instead, I would do 10 times 21. Right, in other words, I go down yes. four and up four. Yeah. 10 times 21 is 210. plus four times seven is 28 is 238 and that's almost as easy as having it memorized and if you have and if you know 15 uh, 15 square which is 225 and I ask you 13 by 17 so hi ah, there you go yes, you so can, I can if, if or I do 15, the trick that you mentioned earlier 10 yeah. times 20 yes. plus 21. Wow. Or you could do 15 squared mm-hmm. minus 4. Or you could do it uh, 170 plus 51. But that's the point. Mathematics is a creative subject. There's more than one way to solve a problem. Okay. Now, in one of your uh, brilliant TED Talks, you said, teach probability, teach statistics before you... you teach a uh, algebra well no calculus uh, okay. yeah in other words al- algebra is at the foundation after you learn yes. arithmetic you have to do algebra but you need then... to solve for X and figure out for why yes <laughs> that's right you yeah, that's right and I had a uh, I heard the talk by a uh, Leonard Wolfram the brother of uh, Stephen Wolfram you yeah. know the founder of Mathematica and he said that math has four parts and it's not yeah geometry twig geometry algebra no that uh, The first part is ask the right question. Mm-hmm. The second part is formulate this question to the two numbers right. and, uh, and, and symbols. Third part is solve and then go back to the real world and reflect, see right. if it works. And what he said that in, in our schooling system, what we do is focusing on part three Exclusively, by hand. Exclusively, yes, yes, by, by hand. hand. <laughs> so, no, we know it, and math, it's, you know, I, I have the book, like, uh, uh, I don't know where, where the book, ah, History of Mathematics by David Burton, and when he says there, the meaning of the word mathematics, basically he's thinking about things in a straight manner. Mm-hmm. Thinking straight. And we are doing things many opposite things sure and my question is why do we need to learn first probability and statistics well I just think probability and statistics is the math that you encounter in your daily life I mean that is you're always taking risks you're always saying hmm is it worth driving for 40 minutes to see this movie or not is this something I want to do you know we, we, we put a cost on things and I think that that is I mean, I, I've gone my entire life, and aside from my academic research in mathematics, I cannot think of a time when I used calculus in the home, where I said, hmm. I need to do a, a second derivative. Or, or I have to look at this in a 
using the tools of calculus. I mean, sure, calculus surrounds us. I mean, the laws of nature are written in calculus, but the But Benford law, we see it more, much more You're going to see often. you'll see yes. Benford's law, you'll yeah. see um you'll see Bayes' rule, you'll, you'll see, see Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers. You're mentioning some of my favorite you subjects. You are the president of the yeah. Fibonacci Association. I'm afraid I am. You know, and you know, so these I are I came across this just today when I when, <laughs> when I completed the research. What 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 again? There is, a, there is a Fibonacci Association and you're the president. I am the president. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, it's a, I could, I could talk for hours about the wonders of Fibonacci numbers and, and, and they, they don't appear in your life as much as people think they do. I mean, as, as much as I am a fan of the Fibonacci numbers, I'm also a little bit of a skeptic that they're not, you know, people have said, oh, our galaxies is a spiral. No, that's we, know that the, the, we know that yeah. we have the golden ratio. Well, the golden ratio shows up often in nature, but not as, not not as often as everybody thinks. I mean, if you okay. read books that say, oh, My the ratio thing. from yes. head yes. to toe, yes. belly button to toe. Everything is everything's 1.6. Any, anything that's anything in yes. spitting distance within 1.6 is easily labeled as golden but ratio. But I think but the ben that ben Benford law is much stronger. Benford's law is fascinating, and it does show up uh, frequently, yes. yes. Um, anyway, so uh, why should probably, I think, I, first of all, I think it's more, you know, probability and statistics. It's it's the mathematics of games and gambling, and that already there's a certain appeal to our students. They want to learn how to win more, right? And uh, uh, even understanding uh, the mathematics of money and how it grows and um, just how things change yes. randomly. I think that's relevant. I think it's interesting. And gosh, these days it's so useful. I mean, one of the one of the the newest most trendiest careers is data scientist. And if you want to be a data scientist, you, you want to have strong gr grounding in mathematics, in statistics, and computer science. If you pick, if you're good at two of the three, you've got, you've got the professional world at your feet. I can yes. tell you, I teach at Harvey Mudd College in Claremont, California, and we're putting out students, whether they're studying math or computer science or some mixture of the two. Yes, it's very important. And they're just, even in today's economy, they're, they're I had David, getting, doing great. I had David Spiegelhalter on, on the show. He was the president of the Society of Statistics in England. Mm. And he's like a, a profession, he is a, a professional of data science and what and how to transfer you know, the old statistics to data science because they usually speak in different jargons. Sure. That's right. That's right. So, right. So like a, mm -hmm. a gambler might say, I'll give you five to one yes. odds yes. is the, is a mathematician says, Oh, you're saying the probability of winning is less than one in six, not one in five, one in six, right? So I, 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 I we have a professional poker mm -hmm. player in the room and he yeah. knows how to, translate from but from odds you know to there is a a letter i think that was written by Jacobi uh, uh, by Jacob Ber bernoulli i think to laplace and he said like i think 200, 200 years ago he said we know to calculate the odds with cards and we know to calculate the odds with dice mm -hmm. but we can it's much harder to move to calculate the odds of staying alive Okay. Mm -hmm. When we mm -hmm. when we teach mm -hmm. statistic, when we teach probability, we do it with coin, we do it with dice, we do it with cards. But when you okay, I want to extrapolate. What is the odds that you will stay alive after sixty? Well, you don't, it, those, these are continuous random variables. Yes. We have ways of modeling them. But what we're also not very good at is when you, it's not simply a probability or not. It's like a, you're assigning values to things like, okay, what, what, if you were to win a thousand dollars tomorrow, how much, how would you feel about that? Suppose that number instead were ten thousand dollars. Suppose you lost ten thousand. Suppose you, it was a million. Suppose you died. I mean, these are majorly different risks and and sort of quantifying those risks. You know, it's not oftentimes in, in game playing, mm -hmm. everything's very linear. Oh, this is twice as much as that. I would be twice okay. as happy if yes, this happened. No. You know, if I if, if I win twenty dollars, I'm probably twice as happy as if I won ten dollars. Sure. But you know the graph doesn't go it, like it doesn't this. stay yes. that way, right? So no. Um, and and those are those are hard. And I'm sure yes. you've you've spoken with guests who are who who've said that people are really bad at making decisions 
th- th- especially that involve um, and again my field of expertise very is, un- unlikely phenomenon yes. you know and I, my field of expertise is machine learning and what we say in machine learning as a joke is that machine learning's systems are extremely good in predicting the past <laughs> because what you're saying when you presume when you're doing a machine lear- learning algorithm is that the future will be sampled or drawn from the same distribution. Now, when you're classifying dogs from cats, you can pretty much assume that, you know, the distribution of how dogs look like and how cats look like is going to change for the last, for, for the next 10 or 20 years. Right. Ever since Egypt. Right. But when you're going to, for the distribution of the Bitcoin price, the distribution today that mm. your nanny know what Bitcoin is. Yes, I have a wallet. (laughs) And it's much, it's so different than what it was like two or three years ago that you cannot, you need to assume or believe that you have the same distributions. Once you don't have the same distributions, all machine learning, many of the machine learning algorithms that we, that we know fall apart. Well, again, so, so for, for very recent and new phenomenon, you have to be very careful. But maybe using machine learning to diagnose diseases and um, medical problems, that's hugely important. No, no, no. It, it's, and that may, not, that may it's stay very, very relevant for a long time. So, uh, Okay, now let's go to your Google Scholar page, okay? Okay. Google well, Scholar page, and now, gee, uh, as, okay. because I'm also a magician, but I'm also a scholar. Now, uh, your most famous book is uh, 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 Proofs That Count. Yeah. Uh, it, was it published in uh, 20. 2003, I think. No, no. no, Proofs that really count. It was published by the Mathematical Association of America. That MAA press may now be under the auspices of the American Mathematical Society, so maybe they've reprinted it. But the, but that was written with Jennifer Quinn, who is currently the president of the Mathematical Association of America. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Jenny. You know, um, so, so, uh, do combinatorics and it'll take you places, right? Okay. Now, um, I have never heard you speak about about your real serious math job. I had Noga Alon on on Mm -hmm. the show, which Mm -hmm. is a very famous. He's in my field of combinatorics. He's one of the the gods of combinatorics. I have a paper with Doron Zeilberger, somebody you should What's your Erdős number? Uh, My Erdős number is two. (laughs) (laughs) Now about two, two. yeah, there was a, in fact, about two. Just Just a second. We need to. We need to write. And we need to write together. a paper. We need. To, we, need <laughs> we need to write something. Out yeah. <laughs> yes. No. I. I um, you know, it was funny. A guy I came. Think to, I four or five. No, I bet it's close. Two. To that. It's wow. gotta be close than that. But anyway. Um, no, 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 I am four or five. I know, but but I'm saying you have to be closer than that. But I. I, I know. Wow, a guy. Uh, yeah, a guy came to me a few years ago who who uh, with a problem that had come from somebody else with a heritage number of one. And I, I normally I might have dismissed the problem, Stick but I said, <laughs> I said, I'm going to work on that problem with you <laughs> so that so that she'll be a co-author of this paper and I'll get my Erdős number of By two. the way, you know that there are some unfinished papers. You, you can get a Erdős number of one. Because there are some unfinished papers. I, I I've heard I've heard some. Uh, if you want, I've heard some mathematicians who've uh, that's right who've okay. worked, who recently got their Erdős so number of one. So what's your field of expertise? Combinatorics, because you have combinatoric equational math. But let's yep. let's stick to combinatorics. Combinatorics, a special passion for Fibonacci numbers. A, a lot of um, a lot of the patterns that involve Fibonacci numbers can be uh, understood by asking a counting question and answering it in two different ways. But I must ask you before you uh, go any further, I thought as a layman, yep. which is a great word for mm-hmm. us, I thought as a layman that Fibonacci number sits under the realm or domain of number theory. It's, it, it, so it's, 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 it where could be. Where are the Fibonacci number? It's like uh, prime number, no? Well, so there may be like, no, they're much better understood than prime numbers. They're very, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. they practically grow at a, in, in a geometric progression. You just okay. multiply by the golden yes. ratio, you get the next one. Prime numbers, they pop up like weeds yes. and they're much, much more, much more on, uh, but there are some uh, open questions like, uh, we know there are infinitely many prime numbers. We don't know if there are infinitely many, infinitely many prime Fibonacci numbers. That's still an open question, for example. Ah, um, yeah, ah, some primes are Fibonacci because they're in the sequence of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. Right. So 13, you see 3, in 5, 13, 13 is a prime and the Fibonacci. 89 is a prime. Right. And, and by the way, they always occur 
um, they, they have to occur at prime locations. So in other words, if you... What um, do you mean by prime location? So the, the fifth, let's see, it, the, the, uh, the fifth Fibonacci number is five. Yes. And five is prime. All right, let's, let's okay. go on. So th after that, we get eight, the, the sixth Fibonacci number is, is eight. So, and, and, yes. and it won't be prime because six isn't prime. The seventh Fibonacci number is 13. Ah, it's and me. seven is prime, so thirteen has a chance of being prime, and it is. You have a proof that the, the yes, Fib you yes. have a proof that all Fibonacci need, needs to be in a prime location. Yeah, exactly, and and the proof is pretty easy if you accept it, in that if um wow. if m divides n, then the nth Fibonacci number will divide the nth Fibonacci number. So if you gave me just some random composite number like um, 99, yes. I can tell you that the 99th Fibonacci number will be divisible by the 9th Fibonacci number and the 11th Fibonacci number, and therefore it can't be prime. Ah, you see, yeah, because wow. of that lemma that's easy yeah. to prove yeah, 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 yes. that if M divides N, then FM divides FN. Um, so, but on the other hand, if you go, for example, to the 19th Fibonacci number, even though 19 is prime, the 19th Fibonacci number is composite. So, wow. so, so we can't immediately say that there are infinitely, even though there are infinitely many primes, there are not infinitely many prime Fibonacci numbers. Wow. All right. Now I'm going to give you some part, something from my recent research that combines all of my interests. It combines combinatorics. It impl it, it uses games and, and, and puzzles. And it's one I like to talk about that I haven't had a chance to talk about enough. And it's the game of bingo. Bingo? Like in the church? Yes. like The ch church that, bingo? Bingo. Amen. Right? Okay. Amen. So, um, Just a second. Let me put on my Nyamika and now... All right. Explain about bingo. Okay. So first of all, <laughs> a bingo card has five letters, a B, I, N, G, and O. Okay. It's a five by five card, right? So there are 25 numbers on it. But the five, the five numbers in under the B are all between one and 15 in some order. Okay. And the five numbers under the I are between 16 and 30 in some order, right? So you, you can have a number like B1. You would not have a number like B75. That's okay. not a, okay. And so th by the way, just a second, all bingos are just going up to 100? 100? Um, uh, 75 actually, 75, because, okay. because the first, the, the first column has some five numbers out of the first 15. The column I is from the next 15. So we have 75 M. different balls. 75 bingo balls. And the objective is to fill every, to, to fill the entire board or to just fill the, a diagonal row or a row. column or a diagonal. It's a very strong game here in Israel. We do not have churches. Okay. We do not. So, okay. okay. So, we do, but so, we don't do bingo. so let's suppose that you were practicing for your upcoming bingo tournament. Not that I'm practicing. You know, you're play. You get. You're <laughs> yeah. playing the game a lot. Just I'm to say, I'm practicing for my next bingo tournament. This yeah. is great. Okay. okay. Now, are you more likely to get five in a uh, uh, five in a row horizontally or vertically? And your intuition. Just a second. Just a second. Okay. Okay. I would say that if it is vertically, that it all need to come from the same small distribution, okay? And therefore, the intuition should be that the horizontal will, will be much more. But I have five different vertical, so might be the same? It is the same, right? In other words, you're just as likely to get these five get your bingo as those five. There's nothing special about those five numbers as those five numbers. Okay, good. Very past the first the first test. Like now you are just like James Randi. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So now you go to this bingo tournament and there are a hundred people there and they each have purchased multiple bingo cards. So maybe there's like a thousand cards being played right okay. now. Okay. And I say to you, or before, before our first game, I say, what do you think? Do you think the winning bingo will be horizontal or vertical? And believe it or not, it's more than twice as likely to be horizontal than to be vertical. And in fact, if we had thousands of players there, maybe, you know, 10,000 cards out there, it's almost three times more likely to be a horizontal bingo instead of a vertical bingo.
So even though you yourself playing individually, it's 50-50, whether it's horizontal or vertical, the um, the winning card the distribution. is much more likely to be horizontal. Now let me try and give you the intuition behind that, okay? Let's take this to an extreme and play this game not with a mere 1,000 cards, but with every possible card out there, all billion, billion, billion possibilities, okay? Galactic bingo. Every creature in the universe has their own different bingo card, okay? Now, in order to get a horizontal bingo, you'll need one of each letter to occur. If a B, I, N, and a G have occurred, but no O's, then nobody has a horizontal bingo. You can't have a horizontal. And the moment five different letters occur, some creature in the universe will have a bingo. Because this is a galactic bingo. It's galactic bingo. Okay, so okay. somebody okay. has it. It's enough to have it on Earth. You have billions and gajillions of creatures. Yeah. So every every possible card is out there. So mm -hmm. when those five numbers are drawn with a B, I, N, G, N, O, somebody has it in their first row. In fact, zillions of creatures out there will have bingos right there. Okay. So... In order to get a vertical bingo, some letter has to occur five times. The moment you have five Bs, there's going to be a yes. vertical bingo. The moment there are five Is, there will be a vertical bingo, correct? Yes. So now I ask you the question, what is more likely to happen first as you're drawing from this bingo bucket of 75 balls that five different letters occur? And it's occur. not bootstrapping you. Take, you're just you're taking yeah, it and throwing and, okay. it away. Taking and throwing it. It doesn't matter if you put it back because everyone has that ball anyway. Okay. So take you know you take it, throw away. What's more likely to happen first? Five different letters or some letter occurring five times? And now those are not the same problem. And and your intuition, most people's intuition, is much more likely to see five different letters occurring than some letter occurring five times. It's like the intuition, you know, when you when you fill out the lottery, the uh, our intuition that gets on the lottery one, two, three, four, five is less likely to get 31, 14, etc. Yeah. Well, but those are the same. It's not, That's not but, but it's not the same. No, it's not the same. It's not the same, but, so why? But, but, but in this case, it's a case of, like for instance, if you wanted to get a bingo in exactly five balls, okay, the number of ways they could get a horizontal bingo is there'd be 75 choices for the first ball, and then once you've chosen it, you have 60 choices for the second ball, because it has to be from a different column, mm -hmm. then 45, then 30, then 15. That's a big number. If they were all coming from the same column, you'd have 75 choices for the first ball, but then only 14 choices uh, for the okay. next, then 13, then 12, then 11. Yes. That product is 50 times smaller than the other product. Oh, okay. Now and if you it. do the careful combinatorics, you can count and say there's exactly a 75.2% chance of getting five different letters before some letter occurs five times. Now, when you're playing in the big bingo hall, once five different letters occur, somebody out there is probably either has a bingo or is very close to having a bingo, and it would be horizontal impossible for it to be vertical. So 75% of time, you can't even possibly have a vertical bingo because it's got to be you know, horizontal. Whereas when you're playing by yourself, once five different letters occur, you, know. you might only have, you may, you're probably nowhere near close to having a bingo. And you're just referring to the first bingo. The first bingo. Yes. The first bingo. That's now, right. Now, how can I utilize what you just told me in order to uh, bring the house down you make you you, I, I you you offer a table you you have a table at the side of the room where you say um I i'm willing to, to get, i'm, I'm willing to, to give six to five odds okay. that it's um that it's a mm -hmm. horizontal vertical bingo instead of a vertical bingo mm -hmm. and people are going to think oh you're crazy it's 50 50 i'll get i'll give you six to five no, okay, odds but in very... fact you you it's more like two to one odds okay so see. this is a this is a a nice way to make some money at a game wow. that wow. can't be beat this is nice okay now uh and f okay la last questions wow 
you just blew my mind Thank and you. it was so much fun and uh, okay just tell me one how how much time do we have left i think negative five minutes negative but go five ahead. minutes no, you have seven you have okay. seven solid minutes seven so, solid so, minutes okay so, seven okay. a prime number make okay. the most of okay it. prime and it's not a fibonacci oh, unfortunately yeah. okay yeah. uh let's could you just tell me one thing about ben benford law because again benford law was uh, utilized in order to detect the all the fiascos they did in greece okay and this oh, is I, a, I, I not heard about the Greek this fiasco. Is be, You'll have to tell me about that later. Because in Greece, what they did, they just uh, make made of the numbers in their accounting. And when you made oh, up numbers, yeah, yeah, you yeah. made with, with the same distribution. I know, I know about how Benford's law. So, yes, what, so okay, for your audience, so yes. Benford's law says that if you, is that many, many numbers that come out that arise in the real world, yes. if you look at their first digit, they those digits are not, Evenly distributed. evenly distributed. So, for example, if you were to measure, if you were to take the 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 first digit that appears on a tax return, yes. and some of your some of your digits are two digit numbers, some are three, some are four, some are five. It doesn't matter. It then well, no, no, it that that, yes. that feature matters. Um, then uh, then about thirty percent of the numbers should be one. And about 17, 18% of the numbers should be two. Only four or 5% of them should be the number nine. I, If you look at things like street addresses, lengths of rivers, distances to galaxies, things that span But not several, just in meters, on centimeters. Meters, in, miles, in, centimeters, in right. Whatever you want. But I'll give you an example where Benford's Law doesn't yes. apply. If we're measuring people's heights in inches or centimeters, right? Now, the number of inches that you know, tall people are, it could begin with a four or five or six you know yeah. but not seven but you're not going to see ones yeah. you're not going to see nines and so benford's law wouldn't apply there okay so but in many quantities that's if let's take my favorite numbers the fibonacci numbers if you took the first thousand fibonacci numbers the first ten thousand the first million fibonacci numbers 30.1 percent of them will begin with the number one now that's a mathematical thing and that 30.1 is the log of two the the log base 10 of two and 47.7 percent of them will begin with a one or a two and that's 47.7 is the that's the log of three and um and and so on so the log function gets used um anyway so uh Uh, this shows up in in it's easy to prove when it shows up in mathematical phenomenon like the first 10,000 Fibonacci numbers or the 10,000 powers of two or powers of pi um, but it's also surprising that it shows up in things like street addresses if you ask your audience mm -hmm. yes. how many people have a street address that begins with one two or three it's about three times as likely as those who have a street address that begins with seven eight or nine and if you're predisposition was to believe they should all be about random and if you ask them about the last digit of their street address it would be random zero to nine occur about equally often and you have an intuition because i had i once heard an intuition about ben 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 for law it goes like this let's say that i have a a 10 increase and in the first year i earned 100 uh, 100 shekels or 100 dollars so next year it's 110 121 100 all the way when i get to 900 after after it after 10 10 10 increase it's going to be 920 a uh, 990 and the other way it's going to be 1000 so that's right if you think about how fragile that first number is there's a lot more you can multiply that in a log chart number. one is much bigger than that's, nine that's correct and so but it's not 30 percent in a log chart it, it well it is actually it is it's it's the log it's the distance between log of one and log of two And that distance is 0.301 and the distance from log of one to log of 10 is one so it is and and so it's basically saying there are a lot of processes out there that are inherently multiplicative and if it's if you have a multiplicative process then you shouldn't be surprised to see uh to see benford's law uh, i remember uh during the last presidential election somebody you know people who were looking for conspiracy yes, theories yes, yes. and they said wait a minute The precincts in this city, in this state, 
are violating Benford's law, that, 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 that the, the Trump voters passed the Benford's law test, the Biden voters do not, therefore we found something. And I go, oh, okay, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll bite. I, I, I love Benford's law. Let's see what's going on. As long as the assumptions are met, then we should see something. Okay. You know, and, um, but in the, in, in this particular set of precincts, all the precincts had the same size. They were all like exactly yeah. a thousand people per precinct. And so if Biden was getting 70, 80 percent of the votes, you would see his numbers are sevens and eights and stuff um, in the precincts, which is very unbenford like. Whereas, um, you know, the Trump voters are getting 10, 20 percent. They were getting a lot of ones and twos. So it looked very Benford like. And so um, it, it, whereas if the precincts had very different sizes, some precincts had 50 people, some people had 4000 people, some people had nine hundred people then if you're getting a 70 80 percent and it's scattered among a whole bunch of different sizes then you're going to see benford's law I and there are ways of making money yes. on benford's law i too. spoke with ted hill he was like a, a oh he's a he's one of the yes, world one experts, one of the experts on, on, law. Yes. on benford law but yeah. now he's a uh, has another thing coming with this uh, male female things listen it was so so much, so interesting and so inspiring. Hey, what a fun conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. The last question that I ask, could you just give me one tip of productivity? Because you do a lot of, of stuff and you're in the Begum and magic in Professor of Mathematics and in Google Scholar and many other things. You can give me just provide one quick one productivity tip. Boy. Um, <laughs> marry a wonderful woman like my wife, Dina, oh. who has allowed me to be so productive in so many areas of my life. Um, I don't know that that's a very generalizable rule, but, uh, that's, that's worked well for me. Okay. Thank you, Dina. <laughs> Art. He says the same about his wife. Yes. Wow. Art, thank you so much for your time and conversation and wisdom. And again, it changed my life. The one thing that I didn't ask you is why boys are much more attracted to those uh, techniques than girls, but uh, maybe in the next conversation. Maybe so. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.